Uh, good morning, everyone. We are Team 3. We're presenting um, the Stage 1 for Automated Cheese Roll Production Machine. Uh, my name is Lias Busexa. Uh, my teammates are Angel Baez and Gustavo Vasquez, who are advisory of Dr. Kusumundo. Uh, this project is funded by Kaya Tago Bakery. So to start with our presentation, uh, let's take a look at what's Kaya Tago. It was founded 18 years ago by David L. Hungry, who is here today. Um, uh, produces around 15 different goods. It sells the um, distributes uh, products to different companies such as Walmart and Publix and exports it to Puerto Rico and Canada. So this project was divided into two sections. So the stage one was uh, the part of the dough uh, through a rolling process, dusted with flour and cut, it, uh, cut the dough with the strips. Stage two will receive the dough strips, put cheese to top and bottom, and then roll it to form like cheese sticks. No, no, no. So our machine in stage one has to perform three main things. Accept the dough of slab, slab of dough that has like a one and a half inch thick. Um, thin it to like a one eight inch thickness and then cut into uh, strips that have like seven by two inches. So this is a video showing the, the old process that they used to uh, do. So they just, this is the big slab, they just cut in a uh, small piece to put for you know to show us the process. They put it in a dough cheater. They go through multiple steps, reducing the thickness. Uh, the planning war on the table is in like manual uh, two. And then this is how they measure the exact distance that the uh, measurement they need. And that's the way how they you know they cut the uh, they cut uh, the strips. So now speak about alternative designs. The first design that we thought about doing was implementing, just adding the systems to their existing dough sheeter. So uh, a cutter somewhere along down the line, a uh, flour shifter somewhere around the ro rolling section. So uh, we would apply flour as it comes by back and forth. Uh, alternate design number two would be a standalone unit. It would have three reduction stages and it would reduce uh, the thickness in one single pass. Also applying flour and cutting at the same at the same pass. And uh, design number three would be the same as last, except they would incorporate a vertical design to allow gravity to help feed it from from one stage of reduction to the next. So this uh, our comparison here. Um, as far as floor space. Design three would be best. It would be the most compact. They would use uh, vertical uh, space versus uh, horizontal space. Um, roller speed adjustability. It, it depends. You know, it could be incorporated or not, depending how you make it. Uh, the flower application they would all have. The thickness adjustability. Uh, they're all based. They would all have uh, ease of use. Obviously, three would be the easiest uh, to use. Single pass, gravity fed. Uh, but Originally, Design 3 was going to be the, the original pick design, but we had to switch, uh, switch it because we found out that you cannot manipulate dough, you can't shrink it uh, too fast in a single step, or, you, or the, the molecular structure of the dough uh, under shearing stresses, it just, it, it, it becomes too dense and doesn't, when you bake it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't become airy and, and fluffy like dough is supposed to. So we had, we chose to go with the original with a design one, which was implementing the system to their existing their existing unit. Well, basically, our objective were to automate the cheese stick production by producing from eleven thousand per week to eleven thousand per day. Also, reduce our labor costs by eighty percent. Some of the challenges that we faced during the optimization was overcoming those alteration from the rollers, and also electronics and programming problems that we had that we're going to speak about in the next slides. Some of the related standards that we follow, basically we're food safety standards, basically all are related to the food in contact with contamination and components labeling standards like agma gearing and ticket temper. Some flower components that we implemented or designed, as we can see here, are international recognized symbols such as hazards and warnings, universal controls and operations. And also, we translate the user model to three different languages, such as English, Spanish, and French. This is the project management chart that we follow. As we can see, on the last month, we did validation testing and the optimization for our design. So we divided the project population in four sections. 
plug receptor and collector, cutters, roller height and gearbox shift actuators, electronics and programming. For the flower system mechanism, we bought a half long size steam table plant that later we modified it to use as a sister. We opened two rectangulars of holes, one inch wide per 18 inches long, where we placed after the stainless steel um, filter mesh in order to use it as a sister. Also, uh, we built a frame where the steam table plant would sit on it. So on this frame, we placed two little, two little small uh, vibration motors, 12, 24 DC. And also, <coughs> we create two of brackets where this system would be placed, would be put in place. These brackets were one four thick, thick, made of um, the stainless steel. And also, between these brackets to the other system, we implemented two um, vibration sandwich mounts two on each side. So we can see this is a half long size steam table plant that we modified it with the two rectangular openers. This is a flower sister design and also we made some simulations where uh, it gives us a factor of safety on the brackets of 15 and for the frame 7. As we can see this is the vibration mounts that we put two on each side of the brackets, so one bracket to the other to isolate vibration. This is the design, this is how it looks. Right here we have a video where we test the, uh, the shifting of the power. As we can see, the consistency is a little bit too low, it's because we are having just one little motor installed on the system due to um, shipping. We didn't get the other one. So for the flower collector, we create a pan, a collector pan, where all the edges of flowers that come from the sifter and passing through the rollers were transferred from this collector pan to another steam table pan where we storage the flower, the excess of flower, so then we reuse it. This is the flower collector pan, as we can see, this pan is declined, so the flower can fall just directly to the other uh, steam table pan where we storage the flower. So now we're going to go and talk about the cutter mechanism. Uh, we tried using some materials that are already mass produced for cost effectiveness and implemented uh, the rest of the cutting device. So we started off with these. Uh, the, the shaft and the cutters, these are already sold in six, uh, four and six inch diameters. They're already stainless steel and they have etched uh, distance marks on the shaft. Um, so that would take care of the cutting of the dough longwise. Now to cut across, we didn't want to have to implement a, a whole nother cutter. So, I mean, another whole nother shaft. So we implemented a horizontal design uh, by notching, notching these blades 180 degrees apart from each other. And, and laser, we laser cut it uh, out of sheet stainless steel uh, interlocking design so they, you, can, you can slip them into each other and interlock them and then we use stainless steel shaft collars <coughs> as a method to holding the base against the, the shaft so the, the two piece shaft collar, the bolt sandwich and you see all the little holes they actually hold, they maintain the horizontal blade up against the shaft so they don't, they don't slide out and then we use linear track actuators on each side of the table to uh, actuate the whole shaft up and down. And this, this is what basically is going to attach, it's gonna make the connection between the cutter, the shaft, and the, and the track actuator. This is a spring-loaded mechanism. Uh, this is the whole unit actually gonna drive up and down, bolted to the, actua to the actuator. And the way that we designed it was the cutter is going to make contact with the table, and then the spring will compress about 3 eighths of an inch. And the travel that was given, we should have about three eighths of an inch in both directions, up and down. So this will take care of some of a, um, you know, belt thickness uh, uh, fluctuations, um, maybe a, an inconsistency in, in level when we, when we first installed it. It's, it's self leveling. Um, <clears throat> so here you can see some some basic testing. We just 
This is some basic testing on the shaft, some deflection and stress analysis. Um, here's a picture of the actual unit, the, the way it turned out. It uh, works as intended. The top bar, uh, you can see there is aluminum. It's just basically to uh, keep the system squared so you can't have a flex in or out on the, on the actuators. So it, it runs true. Uh, the, 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 also, the spring loaded mechanisms were designed in a way where they're, they're easily uh, disassembled without any tools. So we're using stainless steel, stainless steel thumb screws, two on each side. You can remove them. The cap comes out. Uh, the whole, comes out with the spring and the bearing guide, and then the whole shaft can just be lifted out with the pasture bearings on it. It can be cleaned wherever you want, uh, slid right back in, and thumb screws stuck back in. You get a video of it in action, cutting some dough. <clears throat> So the one problem we had with the with the, the unit was I left we left the, the horizontal cutting blade a little dull because the, the other the circular blades are actually not knife edge they have a, a a small flat section on it and we were afraid of cutting the belt cutting into the belt so it was also left slightly dull uh, and as we can as we found out shortly after was that the horizontal blade should actually be knife edge because you're actually making contact with the belt all in one, at the same exact time with the full length of the blade, you can distribute the, uh, the load across it without cutting on top of that. It's, it's because it's rolling along the circular path of, the, of the, the circular blades, it doesn't have any kind of impact against the belt. So uh, one thing we need to change would be the sharpening of the blade for a better horizontal cut. Uh, the cutting will never be perfect on this because of the, the belt texture. So what you end up with is like a, almost like a small serration Serrated, serrated, serrated little stitch, but it's easily pulled apart. <clears throat> so now, as far as uh, lever actuation, we have two levers on the machine. One's going to be the, th the thickness adjustment, and the lower one will be the, the gearbox adjustment. Uh, the gearbox, basically, the only adjustment you really need for the gearbox is basically going to determine the belt, uh, the belt speeds in relation to each other. So depending on which speed you put on and direction the belt's moving, the output, you, uh, sometimes you're going to want the output belt to uh, move faster at a linear speed than the input belt. So that way, if you have a, an issue with widening of the dough, you can move it faster to help pull and elongate instead of widening as it comes out the other side. Um, so this is us just uh, getting preliminary measurements. We're using a torque wrench, and we're trying to figure out how much force this thing's going to see. So these are some values we got um, torque-wise. 7.2 7 foot pounds just to open, just to bring the, the, the adjustment roller up. 12.4 as a feedback. So, what we did there was we kind of we tried simulating um, a big uh, reduction in thickness in one shot where, the, where the, the, the roller gets pushed up and we get back feed uh, force against the thing. So, it was, a, it was a hot, we, we were forcing as much as we can, we got a higher value. Um, we had to use a minimum of a five inch lever, which actually was right around what the factory unit uses, a five inch lever on, on, the, on the thickness adjustment, and it just, it's just tall enough to clear the, the, the thickness stop uh, knob up there. Uh, and then using the five inch lever, we can calculate the amount of force the linear actuator is gonna have to use, about 30, 30 pounds. And we did the same exact thing for the gear adjustment, uh, result with a nine and a half inch lever, which is right around also where the, the factory lever was uh, measured, and that gave us about 28 pounds requirement for the linear actuators that we're going to use to move these. So because we wanted to keep the design compact, we made the, instead of making just straight arms right off of the shafts, we implemented a bend inward and try to tuck all the actuators and everything as far in as possible so they don't hang out, uh, make it more compact. So we put the, the testing uh, through uh, bending and torsional that can be created. And this is the same thing for the other arm. And now this is the bracket that is going to be mounted on the existing frame with the existing bolt holes where the actuators are going to mount to. And this is, this is it. This is them um, installed, finalized. So these are basically, this is basically a list of values we got, worst case scenario for each, 
um, <coughs> plenty of factor safety sign up where we don't have to worry about anything breaking. It's very low force and it's very overbuilt because uh, space or weight constraints weren't an issue. Our main issue here was going to be stretching the budget, making it just making it, uh, you know, getting a machine that works and keeping it budget friendly. <clears throat> so when it comes to electronics, we try to make it uh, a simple circuit as, uh, as possible. So for prototyping, we use an Arduino to program uh, uh, the circuit, the, the, the system, some relays, uh, power supplies, and sen uh, sensors for feedback. And we also use two feedback actuators uh, for um, the thickness adjustment because we needed to know exactly where, where um, how move, how, you know, the position that it moves. And then we use two mini track actuators. As you can see here in this, in this figure, uh, we showed all the relationship between every component in terms of feedback, uh, signal, or power. This is our design circuit. And this is the actual circuit. Uh, we placed it inside the box within the machine, so it's gonna, when you close that, it's going to be protected. Um, we had a problem with, uh, with sensors. So, uh, like the feedback, uh, the feedback, the act feedback actuators or um, the infrared sensors, they were given like spikes. For every 10 to 15 readings, they, they get one, one spike and then uh, they destroy the whole, um, uh, the whole loops, you know, in the code. So what we did, we implemented uh, some kind of uh, smoothing functions or digital filters. So the, the signal uh, turns from getting spikes until like perfect, perfect smoother. Um, for the cost analysis, our budget was $1,850. We spent um, uh, $1,600 in components, uh, $420 in manufacturing, and we had to pay $165 in our packet. Uh, our initial estimated um, manufacturing cost was uh, $4,100. Uh, components, $5,000. Uh, and based on our selection and um, uh, component selection, we, we, we cut that cost by 80% for the manufacturing and 68% uh, and for, for the components. And the reason for that because we didn't buy like fancy things such as like um, uh, industrial PLC or uh, laser sensors. So this is just an image of the complete design uh, in SOLIDWORKS 3D model. <clears throat> and this is an actual picture of it overall as a unit. And this is going to be a video of it just running through the cycles. Um, the steps would have to be modified, but this is going to be basically the procedure it's going to run through. You can't hear it, but the, the sifter runs as the dough is running uh, under it. It switches direction, goes back, and just moves this over and over, adjusting thickness down to a certain thickness. And then on the last step, it brings the cutters down, runs it all the way through. <laughs> so now, future work, there's a lot of things that can be improved on here. Like I said, we are a very limited budget and we really wanted to have a working machine. Uh, unfortunately, not everything is ideal in this case. So. Right off the bat, uh, the PLC, we we're using an Arduino that's it's very, it's very not suited for this. It's more of a toy. Uh, we should get an industrial PLC, something sealed, something ru uh, rugged that will handle this for a long time. As far as uh, distance sensors, we're using those sharp infrared sensors, but they're you know under $20 and they're very jittery and not very accurate. Uh, ideally, we would, if you wanted more steady repeat repeatability, you should use some kind of laser sensor. For more accurate distance uh, measuring, uh, one thing that we're we, we're thinking is uh, the sensor readings. We might be getting a lot of interference from the vibration motors and, and the motors around in the power supplies. So implementing shielded wiring, uh, maybe to protect it from interference, would uh, in, uh, would help the sensor reading. Uh, and also industrial grade actuators. The actuators we use are cheap, and you know they're not very. They, they get the job done, but they're not made for, you know, food environment where things can get wet. Um, 
they have there's, they have some splash resistance. They're IP54 rated, so they can break, they can hold, withstand a little bit of splashing. But uh, I wouldn't uh, rely on them for too long. Uh, sealed electrical components, obviously the box, uh, all the the, the board, uh, everything is kind of just open. The power supply is open, um, and it is within a box, and then that box is within the frame, the bottom. So it has double protection, but nothing is actually sealed. Ideally, we would use all sealed components to protect it from the harsh environment of just flour everywhere, really fine flour. Uh, safety enclosures for all the the added equipment. We should put it. We should have put a cage over the cutters to keep our uh, hands away from it, and we should have built a sheet metal enclosure around the actuator, the arms and stuff to just prevent any kind of problems. People sticking their arms while it's being actuated and maybe pinching or uh, you know binding their hands up against something. <clears throat> um, ideally. We would have an automated process of transferring our strips from our machine to the following stage. It would uh, increase the production rate greatly, but like I said before, the, the budget and the time frame just didn't, uh, we couldn't figure out anything that was affected to that. Um, the one thing that's not exactly food grade on this, which was used for now, were the bearings that goes on the end of the shafts. Uh, ideally, they're replaced with stainless steel ones. They are double sealed to protect for a while, but the actual bearing is not, the bearing race is not stainless. So that could be a, a, a cheap, simple uh, replacement. And uh, the, we should implement a small vibration motor like we did on the pan, on the on the top of the sifter. Uh, it would be ideal to implement one on the, on the angled collection pan on the, below the rollers, because what we're having is a lot of uh, buildup of flour on top of the pan and not actually sliding down so you would it would actually have to collect and build up to a certain mass and then eventually would expect it to, to slide down so with a vibration motor after every cycle that runs through you can hit it with a little bit of vibration and it would just uh, vibrate its way down <clears throat> thank you just we can take a few comments yes yeah, first, sure. that's what one uh, actually, that's very cool. It, it, it works nicely. It's too fast for those guys, right? It's flying everywhere. Now, you mentioned the food grade and all that. So, uh, FDA will have to know about all this, but are you concerned about metal filings or something going into the food? I know that's outside your scope of your project here, but you have to have like metal sensors or something like that. Usually, they do that for food. Mm -hmm. Is some shaving going into the food? No. Um, we didn't think of that. I mean, uh, shavings, we I'm not sure. The machine was already made like that by a, a well-known, a well-known company. Hand thing, right? Before it, it, yeah. it was, so. we added actuators, and they don't sit on, over the, the actual. Well, the actuator system doesn't sit over the food. That's not really a big concern. Uh, the vibration system, yes, I guess it's possible. Well, I'm, more, I'm more talking about a piece of the cut, horizontal cutter or something breaking off. Yeah, you know what I mean? uh, when it, it, it were to break off. Um, Worst case, I'm just saying, I don't know how that, I don't know what I'm talking about with when it comes to food, but right? usually I think I've seen information on that where, where they'll show a big plan, I've seen on TV, you know, where they show the whole process and they say, here's a metal detection sensor. Yeah. Yeah. We, didn't, we didn't really think of that as a big issue because actually the forces applied are very minimal. The, the cutter, the cutter uh, shaft and the, and, the, and the blades and all that is roughly 15 pounds. And then the spring force added to that on each end are roughly four or five pounds each end. It's not very, really, it's yeah. not very, really, then you get distributed across 11 blades and then as the horizontal one comes around, you're actually distributed across the long section. And it's spring loaded, it's not forced, so if there were going to be anything, any kind of something to roll under there that's hard, that's not supposed to be there, it should absorb the impact. Um, but yeah, I guess that would be a good thing to implement. For, mass, for larger scale mass production. Right. Okay. Uh, the question I'll ask you again on the safety side. Um, you, you, you said that you've met the standard of uh, 21469 for lubrication and incidental contact. What did you do actually on the system to meet that standard? Well, basically, the standards that we follow were related to the uh, contact contaminations. Uh, the one we follow, 
on also the materials that we use as stainless steel and aluminum. Uh, we did the research and we find that those uh, metals were good to use. Actually, actually there's, no, there's no lubrication. It was, it was, you put it up on the board, it was one of the standards. Oh, yeah, that you, I, 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 you referenced and you said that you met, so I, I just... I, I didn't say... I didn't, yeah, I didn't your say your pre presentation did. Okay. Okay. Uh, safety. Uh, pinch points, obviously, are a big concern all over this machine. Right. Uh, lockout, uh, the, the machine guarding uh, OSHA wasn't one of your standards, and I would assume that you would have to protect against those things in order to even turn this machine on in a commercial application. Um, stored energy, because you've got a, a, a drive. Is there anything in this system that was designed to shut down the energy source if... As, if you watched the, the, at the beginning where, we used, where my partner was talking about um, talking about global design, we actually took a picture of it. The machine originally didn't have any kind of emergency shutoff or anything. But it was a manual machine. That was the... It, you're going into a cutter, which the cutters are manual. Right. Now all of a sudden you've got cutters that are in line with a, a, a stored energy source right. uh, oh. potential. What we did was, this originally was the work inside the machine, this is where all the handles were. Mm -hmm. uh, we put a sign on there just for the sign does, the reading. it's nice to have, but it's not, not going to pr protect my operator. Right. Right. Um, so what we did was, we actually flipped the machine around and you work on the opposite side now, so it's keep you away from from the, this mechanism, okay. and we implemented uh, an emergency stop a button on the other side, easy to reach on the outside edge of the frame, so it's very easy to reach right, uh, right next to the, uh, the go button, the start button. Okay, questions for yourself here. Um, why did you set up a system that did not have roller speed adjustability? Roller speed? Yeah, in, on one of your first comparators, you said, you said that this did not have roller speed adjustability, and I would have thought if you were trying to optimize the total amount of output of a system, I'd want to match my roller speed to my cutters to my system. So I'd want to have the ability to adjust the speed on the system. Why, why did you make a decision not to control roller speed? In this machine, we can control, uh, we, can, we can change the, the, the rollers, the uh, high roller. But the, the, you know, the speed, we, we don't have that much choice. You know, the, the, the conveyor speed, it's not that much choice. Can go from. What are you saying is that we didn't we didn't want to tap into the machine itself. I'm not going to answer. Sorry. Thank you. Because you're all getting graded in Sorry. No, but I didn't get exactly the question. What it was like? Can you repeat the question again? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. On one of the earlier slides. Okay. One of the big advantages I think of the the uh, proposed design over here was it had roller speed adjustability. There you go. And you're saying that this design does not have roller speed adjustability, and I was trying to understand why that decision was made. The first design, the first, the first choice. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, initially, when we made this chart, we didn't we didn't have that machine, and we didn't okay. know all the, the bells and whistles the machine had. Okay. We assumed that it was steady state because uh, one single speed because of what we saw when they had it, and they showed us how it operated. So we assumed it was, there was no speed because of their operation. Uh, after the design, the, initial, the, the final design changed and we had, we had to use the machine, we got it. We realized the machine has a, um, a little potentiometer on the side, a knob that gives you a range that you can actually adjust the belt. You have a very, yeah, it's, it's not a large range. You can't completely come, come to a crawl and you can't really fly, but we were trying not to touch the, what's implemented into the machine from factory because it has a VFD in it and we didn't, you know, the budget being limited, that wasn't a huge concern at the moment. We'd rather get something that would actually work and help with the strips before touching adjustable speed. It, 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 with the speed that it's at and different speeds that you can adjust, you would get an output. But if we, if we dipped into making the, the speed adjustment greater, we might have run short on funding for some other parts that would have completely... That's called design, my friend. That's fine. Question for third fellow here. Cleaning. Did you take into account cleaning in development of this system? And I'll use an example. I, I noticed your sieve screens. Oh, yeah, yeah. You didn't have a, a seal 
at the screen interface that I would have thought you would have needed to prevent uh, flour getting in there, capturing contaminants over time, and then redistributing that into, into my bed. You're talking about the sensor? Yes. Well, cleaning is, is it to remove contaminants or cleaning? And if you want to change the the size of the mesh, of the stainless steel mesh, is also easy to remove if you want to have a very good cleaning. But I would go through your whole system. Was was cleaning taken into account when designing this system? If you put, put back up the picture of the finish. If we take into account cleaning, uh, yeah, so we the, the pen, the, no, the, yeah, the, 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 the conceptualized picture of the whole thing. All the way down. All the way down. At the beginning of the section. Right there. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. The, the full assembly. The full system. It's at the bottom. This the very oh, bottom. The, the machine. Last one. Machine. There we go. You can put one back. There you go. What I'm saying is that the steam table pen is easy to remove. It's just sitting on the frame. So in case you want to like deep clean it, you just take it off. Uh, was all of this mechanism developed to be clean? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the pan actually... Everything come apart? Yeah, yeah it's the, 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 the pan itself just rests, the outer lip rests on top of the frame. So you can literally just put your hand in there, lift it up like this, and it comes right out. You can go dip it in hot water and, and soap or whatever you want to clean it with. Uh, the actual frame, the aluminum top piece that sits on top of the vibration isolator, we actually mounted them with wing nuts, so you can just remove it with your fingers if you want to clean that part as well. Um, the cutter, like I said, is two thumb screws per side, and the thing comes right apart, and you can lift the blade right out as a complete unit. You what about the spring-loaded mechanism? Uh, when I looked at that, it didn't look like it was protected from uh, right there, the back. If I got flour into that system, would it function? Uh, it could be cleaned. I, as you can see down here, this is just a stop of the bearing. It was left open on the side. It's not completely sealed to allow things, to allow flour to pass through, not build up. And it's are there clearances down the, the the drives on the side, for example? Uh, the linear slides on the side. There's. What do you mean? Is it, is it precise? Like is it too tight? Yeah. I mean, can I get powder out through them? Am I going to bind up this system with powder? It's going to get everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I didn't uh, submerge it and fill it with powder because it's not supposed to be filled with powder. But if, let's say, you have a binding issue, like I said, two thumb screws, and this cap right here, just right out, it takes the guide rod, the spring, and this bearing guide along with it. And then you basically have nothing inside except for a shim in the back that you can access every single little piece very easily. It takes 10 seconds to take apart. Thank you. Any other comments? We need to move on. Steve? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, for your noise concerns, I would um, take a look at shielding your wires beneath where you have actual like uh, electromagnetic fields being generated, so like near your motors or something like that. Um, and I would also consider maybe grounding your components because um, a lot of the times we get random noise um, because you just have like electricity flowing on the surface of your, of your metals. And because your table is stainless steel, it actually doesn't conduct uh, very well. So you, you can't ground your electronics to the table. You'd have to ground it to something else. Um, so I, I would just look at it if you're still not solving your, your uh, interference problems. Because um, I, I would say that's probably a big issue. That, I mean, there's no way you guys would know because we're enemies, right? Like, that's not a thing we deal with. Well, what, what, the one way we, we, we came to the conclusion that it must have been a large interference issue was um, we were having huge issues with it. It would just, uh, Arduino would just, uh, would just uh, jump the cycle or would reset altogether very quickly and it just wouldn't cycle through. And, and we did this forever, trying to figure out, the, thinking it was the code and things like that. And at one point, um, you know, connections were temporary at that moment. And the connection on the vibration, I mean, on the, on the vibration motor at the top came loose, and it started cycling through perfectly fine, yeah, without the vibration motor kicking on. And then we realized that the wiring from the vibration motor ran down, and then actually the sensor was just like kind of below it, and they would run yeah all together down into the system. 
Yeah, and that's how we for sure determine had to be there has to be a lot of interference. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you're running uh, AC current right next to a sensor line, a very sensitive like 420 milliamp sensor line, tons of interference in your system. So I would recommend shielding the sensor line and only portions that you're running parallel, or just run the sensor line in a, in a different path, probably a couple inches away. That should solve your interference problems. That's what we did towards the end. We routed the wiring somewhere else. Uh, I would also shield your Arduino in a Faraday cage, which is just like a little metal enclosure, and that solves your issues of having to get a more expensive uh, controller, because then you can just pull, like uh, epoxy the inside and pop the board in there, so you don't have to do uh, more expensive hardware, and you also prevent um, any further like ESC discharge or um, interference issues if for some reason that box is ever interfered with um, from some outside source that you're not going to be aware of. But besides that, I think you guys did a pretty good job. Thank you. Thank you very much.